Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, good evening to today's uh, Kavea Talk Digital. We're really excited. You've got two members of the digital data science team and uh, George Just, who we'll all introduce ourselves in a minute. Tonight, we're going to talk to you about some of the really exciting projects that we've been doing in the data science space. Um, and we're going to be supported by George Just, who's going to tell us a little bit more uh, about what the market's doing as we've worked extensively uh, with SAS. So we'll just do a quick round of introductions and then we'll get started. So I'm Tom, I'm the lead data scientist for Kavea. I've been here about three years. Uh, my background is in mathematics and computer science. Ashley? Yeah, cheers, Tom. So hi, everyone. I'm Ashley. I've been at Kavea for nearly four years now. Um, my background spans the pricing team and the data science team at Kavea. And similarly to Tom, my background uh, is also mathematics and data analytics too. Uh, and I'll pass over to George Just next. Thank you very much, Ashley. Uh, so my name is George Kavadansi Liu. And apart from a very long name, uh, I work as an AI and analytics lead here at SAS. Uh, my background, uh, I'm working with organizations uh, like Covea, advising how to extract more value out of the data. So nice to meet you all. Fantastic. And just just so you know, um, the the if you've got any questions, we're mostly working on a chat based system tonight. So if you've got any particular comments you want to ask, please feel free to comment in the YouTube um, channel. Um, but failing that, if you've got any other comments, feel free to put them in teams and we can try and uh, and we can try and contact you. OK, let's make a start. So just to begin with, uh, let's talk about who we are as a team. So Kavea Digital Data Science have been around and describe a data science team. Some people describe it as being made up of the pillars of mathematics, computer science and data. Some people think it's made up of data, technology and people. Well, this definition we've come up with ourselves. So we think that the, who we are is based around, firstly, experimentation. This is the core of what we do um, at Kavea Digital. So whether a problem presents itself through the data itself or whether one of our business colleagues comes to us with an exciting proposition, the very first thing we do, this is the real scientist in us, is that we put together a document, a scientific document to try and formalize the problem and try and prove, can we help, for example, improve our customer journey? Or can we comp compete against uh, claims fraud, some of which you'll see later on. Secondly, we have research. So research is really important for us. So we also try and not only experiment with the platforms themselves, you know, how we actually go and do, do data science, but also the algorithms that we sit on top of them. So you're going to be seeing throughout this presentation quite a few examples where we've used the latest research in academia to try and better improve uh, some of the processes that we operate. And finally, this is an interesting one. Not many people will necessarily use the word entrepreneurship when they're thinking about a data science team. But I think this is really true because ultimately we're salespeople as well. Our job is to bring data science to our business and to the industry. You know, we work in any and every part. So we're kind of a jack of all trades, really. We need to be able to not only implement machine learning models, we need to be able to take the business on a journey with us. So I find the entrepreneurship style, especially as we're a young team, is really key in, in, in what we do. But what does this mean? So we're a team of five people. We've got five data scientists. We means we've got apprenticeships on the way. We've got a new graduate, which we're really excited to have. We're doing it. We're building a podcast series. I think this is the fifth public talk. Oh, well, probably six by the time the technology problems we've had. Uh, fifth or sixth public talk that we've done since uh, since we began. Wrong laptop. But why are we doing this? Well, we're doing this, A, really to turn data to an asset. So we know that every company, every business, even you yourself, create lots of data and information. And what we want to do is turn that into actionable insight. We want to capture business processes and human knowledge in the machine world. And we do this to help us enable revenue growth, obviously, but improve our efficiency. Two of the projects you're going to see today are centered around those two themes. So we're really excited to present to you some of the work that we've been doing in the claim space. So without any further action, Ashley, take it away. Thank you, Tom. 
So uh, now that you've heard a bit about what um, we do as a team and who we are, um, we can go into a bit more about the what we do aspects of our role as well. So on the slide here, you can see uh, there were two initial use cases that we worked on uh, in our team. Uh, the first of these involved working closely with the fraud team here at Surveyor to try and tackle fraudulent third party remote injury claims. So some of you might be wondering what I mean by this. Well, to this more simply, uh, these are claims made by third party um, drivers where either them themselves or one of their passengers has sustained an injury when involved in an incident with a conveyor policy holder. Um, however, it won't come as a surprise to you guys watching and listening that uh, not every claim in insurance is made legitimately. And so therefore, uh, we try to tackle these to make sure that we, the claims we are dealing with are legitimate. Uh, to give you some examples of when um, claims might not be legitimate, uh, could be where a driver, for example, wants to exaggerate the injuries they've sustained in an incident, or even might um, say that they had a car full of passengers when really they were just the only person in the car at the time of the incident. And so therefore, in order to try and identify where these suspicious claims may be occurring, uh, Tom's built a model which calculates the propensity of a claim being fraudulent, um, split by different types of fraud as well. And so this insight is then shared with our fraud team on a regular basis and from there uh, they can incorporate this analysis uh, into their fight against fraud as well. So whilst our fraud teams do already do an amazing job at what they do, uh, we're hopeful that by adopting uh, analytics into this area, we'll be able to uncover even more fraudulent claims going forward as well. And then speaking of claims, uh, this was also the basis for the second use case that we're working on as well. Um, and just to give you a bit more context about this second use case as well, this was to do with claims liability and motor claims can settle in one of three ways, either at fault, non-fault or disputed. And so uh, there's some claims which are very easy to try and ascertain who's liable. And that might be, for example, if driver A goes into the back of driver B and driver A at the end will be like, holds her hands up and says, right, sorry, that was my fault. I'll take the blame here. Um, there might be other instances, however, where imagine you've got two cars in Tesco car park, uh, both reverse into each other at the same time, don't check her blind spots properly, but they're both blaming each other for the incident occurring. So it's in situations like that where it's quite difficult to try and figure out who's actually at fault for the uh, incident. And so we're hoping that we can start to um, help uh, try and determine what this will be from the outset with the help of um, AI and analytics as well. Uh, and you can see from just from those two examples I gave there, it's not always black and white as to who's uh, potentially at fault um, for a claim. And unfortunately, this is something I've uh, experienced firsthand because I didn't have to go on Google for this image. This is one of my cars from a few years ago uh, after I was involved in an incident. Um, and at the time, it took quite a long time to settle and uh, as a result, it involved quite a lot of stress uh, for myself too. So this is part of the reason why we've looked at what we've sought out to build this model as well, because not only do we want to improve the claims uh, processes internally in Psychobea, but we want to um, create a better claims experience for the customers as well. And so um, just checking my notes very quickly. Um, yes, yeah, so like in Tom's model, um, what I'm doing with uh, my model as well is try and uh, basically predict the propensity for a claim to either settle as fault, non-fault or disputed. And so we're hoping that by using machine learning and historical claims data, uh, we'll be able to determine liability faster than we already do as well. And as with both models, uh, like I said, both the models that myself and Tom have made, it's important to highlight that we're not looking to replace our colleagues in the claims and frauds teams. And instead, we want to enhance the decisions that they're making as well um, in their day-to-day -day roles. So with this next slide, um, we're talking a bit more here about the projects that we did again. Um, but it's worth highlighting that these were sort of amongst the first machine learning and data science models actually produced within the company as well. And so whilst this provided us within the team and uh, other people within the business with a lot of excitement, it wasn't an easy journey um, throughout that time. So first of all, um, the data that we needed to be able to uh, work on these models wasn't easily accessible. And so therefore we had to spend a lot of time uh, gathering, processing and analysing the data before we could even contemplate building a first machine learning model. It's um, amongst the data scientists listening as well, it's probably common knowledge that a lot of the time we spend in our role is actually working with the data and um, just basically getting it to a point where we can start modelling it. Um, and so the work that we did in these two models was no exception to that either. And so the vast majority of this preparation work as well was um, undertaken in SASFI, 
Uh, and this was a software that neither myself or Tom had really used much before joining the data science team here at Cavea. So, um, yeah, so using, sorry, screen's um, Yeah, so using um, SAS, we're able to utilize a combination of different uh, data sources uh, that we hold within the business. Um, but in addition to that, we reached out to experts uh, inside Cavea that had a great uh, wealth of domain knowledge as well. It's very important to be able to utilize um, the skills that Tom was talking about earlier, uh, in addition to the business context as well. Um, so going back to the modeling that we're doing and uh, the work on the projects. So um, this was all done um, inside the Sasfire platform. So this included uh, gathering the data in the first place to um, carrying out feature engineering and also from doing the hyperparameter tuning during the model building to actually building an interactive report that could be shared uh, directly to our internal customers, both in frauds and claims teams. And so um, before we talk about um, the reports in more detail, um, I just want to reiterate that with this journey, we've essentially gone from having disparate data sets from in different areas of the business and having human led analysis in the fraud and claims team to being able to deliver AI products straight into the hands of our uh, internal customers as well, uh, allowing them to scale up their operations and work more effectively as well. Um, Tom, can we go on to the next slide, please? I don't know if it's on that. Yeah, no, it's just come up. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so unfortunately, we're not able to share a live demo with you guys today, just due to the sensitive native, uh, sensitive information that is contained within these reports. So we've been able to provide some uh, screenshots for you uh, today instead. Um, I'll quickly run through some of the functionality that you can see in these screenshots before passing back over to Tom, who will talk a bit more about explainable AI as well. So on this, on, in these uh, screenshots, you can see the layout is very similar um, to both. Uh, both are hosted within the Sasfire platform. Um, so we've opted to include some features that give the users confidence in what they're looking at. So that includes the date that the model was last run, um, some time filters that allows them to uh, specify what period they want to view the data, data for. And because these reports are interactive as well, they will update dynamically as well. Uh, there's also the option to be able to filter um, for either particular claims or particular types of claims, whether it be um, a claim which is likely to be fraudulent or a claim where, say, the claim system thinks it's at fault, but actually our model says maybe you should reconsider this, it might be disputed or non fault instead. Um, and these reports are updating uh, regularly, so on a 24 hour basis, um, new claims and updated claims are processed, and the report is updated, ready for the fraud and claims guys. I'm going to uh, turn on the computer in the morning. Um, what I'll do now is I'll pass back over to Tom to yeah, explain a bit more about explainable AI. Thank you, Ashley. So hopefully you can see that we've tried to do something that really didn't exist before in most areas of our business. So, you know, a really quite an innovative product for us to get started on. One of the challenges we experienced while doing that, which was probably the most elusive, as the title um, I'd says is explainable ai now to highlight what that means uh, i i literally today did about a five minute google search of news articles and and, and documents uh, about explainable ai and you can see these at the top of the screen so ai makes decisions we don't understand that's a problem explainable ai is needed for autonomous vehicles and especially self-driving cars Computer says no, AI is need to be fair. This is probably one of the biggest topics at the moment in the artificial intelligence world. The reason being is that fundamentally, we don't, we tend to fear what we don't understand. Now you probably think, why on earth would I mention something as uh, philosophical as that? But there's some logic in this. If a machine learning model, for example, one that was there to categorize whether your claim should be paid or not, whether your mortgage should be approved, whether your life insurance policy should be accepted. If that was done wholly by a machine learning model, would you not expect an explanation as to why? In the normal world, if somebody has an opinion or a, a, an abject view on you, you can naturally question the status quo. That's a very human thing to do. But when a machine learning model predicts something about you. It's not as simple as that. 
Many of the most advanced AI techniques that we have today are what are called black box models, which means they're incredibly good at what they do, but they're very transparent, uh, opaque rather. We can't see why they make the decision. Hence why explainable AI has become pretty much a movement in the past couple of years or so. And now all of a sudden, everybody is talking about it. So much so, and I realize you may not be able to read some of this text below, and frankly, I don't blame you. This is an extract from the 2018 Data Protection Act. And for those who don't really follow the whole Brexit deal, this is essentially our replacement to GDPR. But there are some interesting extracts that I actually went down to dig and find. I am definitely not a lawyer, and I've confirmed that I don't ever want to be. But I can see here, it says, a decision taken based solely on automated processing. The data subject actually has the right for, the, for us to reconsider a decision if it's been made by artificial intelligence. And to consider, could we make a decision that isn't wholly based on AI? And this is just the beginning. Because the Alan Turing Institute, a well-known think tank for this type of thing, is advocating for a legally binding right to explainability. They've already been lobbying the commons as, you know, in, in very recent times to do so, which means that within, within years, we can expect there to be a legal requirement to explain why we make an AI decision. And there are lots of implications for that, both technical for us as, as machine learning developers it's important that we understand why an AI model has been made and for the people who consume AI to build trust in the system as to why predictions are made. So how did we tackle this problem? So you saw earlier an example of one of our early prototypes for machine learning in claims. Well, we wanted to bring that AI directly to our users. So what you can see is a little workflow diagram of some of the research and prototyping that we did of how we would bring those that explainability directly to our users without technical reasoning required, without you being needed to need a mathematics PhD. We wanted to make this as simple as possible. So whenever claims data is received, the machine learning model runs, but so does an explainer. And the explainer not only helps us with the prediction, but it will also tell you why on a local level did that prediction get made? And then that's delivered to the fraud expert. And there are so many ways that you can do this. If you ever want to find more academic papers and you know what to do with, just Google this subject. There is so much content being written about this at the moment. So we use a technique called LIME. And this stands for, this is quite a mouthful, Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations. I had to write that down. I can't remember that off by heart. But what this tool does, or this technique does, is allows us to explain on a local level what a machine learning model is doing. On the bottom left-hand side of your screen, you should see a rather bizarre looking graph. The background of which has two contrasting colors, one sort of a pinkish hue and the other blue. And you'll also notice the shape of it's quite unusual. It's not a square or a triangle or a circle. But if you can put your conceptual thinking hats on, imagine that this was a claims database of all of the claims that we have in our system. The boundaries are not very clear which claims are clean, which claims are not. So in this particular diagram, we've represented um, claims that are not fraudulent as blue circles and claims that potentially are fraudulent as red crosses. What LINE does is it analyzes the local instances around. So that rather bolder X there in the middle of that uh, dotted line is the particular instance that we want to predict an explanation for. So let's say the model has predicted this claim quite possibly is fraudulent. So what LINE then does is go and analyze the uh, instances around that to try and figure out, well, what made those clean? What made those fraudulent or potentially fraudulent? And then we get, we build up a local explanation. That is of course a very high level reasoning, but essentially that's what it does. It's a locally interpretable model in, an, in, in, in a very difficult to understand space. So what that meant is what you can see on the right, which is a very early prototype of a variant of the uh, Lime explainer values. So we can see 
I'll just I'll explain what some of the variables mean because you might not be able to see the detail. For example, witnesses present. We can see that that is the most important variable in making that decision. So we so what we can get is users can see why the model had made its decision. This is incredibly important for AI research because now we can actually open up as to why. And this led to two very important conclusions for us. Firstly, that the model was more accepted. Our fraud users going about their jobs could understand why the decision was made, even if they agree with it or they don't. And that's really important to remember. And secondly, even though this is a local description, this doesn't necessarily build a function to describe the model as a whole, but it does give us insight into how the model works on a bigger scale. For example, when developing this, it was transpired because of our explainability engineering that the model was being far too biased and overfitting on certain variables. For example, which broker this, mod, uh, this claim came from. And it was only really because of the explainability engineering that our assessors went, that's not quite right. And we were able to re-engineer re the algorithm to do so. This is just the beginning of what we want to do in explainability engineering. And this is rapidly becoming a discipline. I can foresee within the next five years that there are dedicated professionals in just explainability engineering. Um, and there are many more methods that we want to trial and experiment and publish research on. But I think the main point here is that while we were developing this, we've remained in touch with what the market is saying and what the industry is moving. And we fortunately today have somebody who is well versed in what the industry and market is doing. Georgios works with lots of clients, not just in insurance, but in financial services as a whole, and has tremendous experience, and certainly when they were helping us develop our own AI products. So Georgios, if you wouldn't mind, to just share a few industry insights that I know SAS, who have a massive presence in the world of analytics, he might be able to share for us. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, with this slide, I, I just tried to capture some of the uh, leading industry trends uh, within insurance. Uh, so I'll start with uh, the priorities. So some of the priorities that we see organizations focusing on right now. Uh, so we definitely see a move towards a, a more customer centric uh, business model. And if you reiterated that earlier, Ashley and Tom. Uh, so Insurance customers like myself are kind of expecting to get the same kind of fast and simple service like the one we enjoy from online experiences with our bank or retail. Uh, so that is obviously pushing insurers to rethink and redesign some of their customer journeys. Uh, and claims being the most important one, right? So it was nice sharing one of the your personal examples, Ashley, when you are at that vulnerable state where you had an accident. Uh, the experience you have with your insurer uh, during the claims process is going to make or break uh, your relationship uh, with them. So that claims is basically the moment of truth, right? And we see a lot of uh, a lot of happening now to make that process a, a lot easier. So another priority is obviously automation, trying to automate some of the processes, reduce the friction, and achieve uh, straight through processing. So moving that claims process as fast as possible and uh, making uh, the customer experience better. And data science is at the heart of it, right? It has a big part to play for all of this, and it's a top priority for all, all insurers worldwide uh, because they realize that the benefit of applying AI across all areas of business is delivering a, a lot of benefit. Cloud, lastly, is, is another priority. Obviously, moving to cloud, adopting cloud strategy uh, has allowed uh, insurers to realize uh, the added advantages of cloud computing, like uh, cost reduction and flexibility, which brings me to data. Uh, so in order to achieve some of those propositions, you need data. And today, as Tom mentioned, insurers have uh, access to more data than ever before. But those live in disparate systems. Uh, and one of the key priorities right now in insurance is how we bring together uh, those databases, how do we break down those uh, silos, and how we make it accessible to, to our internal uh, users. And uh, you touched upon that, uh, Tom, we've, we've discussed at length on how you had some issues with accessibility at the beginning, but once uh, data were available to you, you were able to deliver some of those amazing projects you, you've mentioned earlier. 
So there's a growing realization right now in insurance that some of the data held within the companies are not accessible by the people that will benefit most. Uh, and bringing uh, me to the third point, which is now customers or insurers are trying to get access to not only traditional data sources, but also external data sources like third party data, uh, but more importantly for fraud and financial crime, uh, identity data. So how we identify or authenticate uh, or how we go about our KYC, know your customer process. So focusing on fraud and moving on to fraud, uh, what we see is insurers are now starting to expand fraud controls uh, into new lines of business. So it's not just traditional motor insurance, but also property, travel or pet. Uh, but we see a, a new, new risks emerging. So uh, we see a lot of customer gaming going on. So uh, obviously, making that move into more, a more customer-centric uh, insurance, uh, moving things to digital and the rise of aggregators and price comparison web websites have improved the customer experience, but also has created opportunities for fraudsters. So now that most interactions can be done online, those fraudsters can carry attacks uh, from the comfort of their own house. So when we talk about customer gaming, gaming is people trying to game the system, going on to price comparison websites, changing their details over and over again in order to achieve uh, a, uh, a smaller premium. But also we see the same from the agent side, so deception by the agent for their own financial gain. And some of the techniques and uh, machine learning and AI techniques that you guys mentioned earlier are a way to uh, to fight those new emerging risks. It's, it's a new way of capturing those new patterns because that would not be available with traditional systems. Uh, which moves me to investigation. So it's not just about finding new uh, uh, new fraudulent claims. Uh, it's not only about detection, but we also we see a lot of focus in investigation. So Insurers right now are putting far more focus around investigation, case management and intelligent uh, management of how do I go about understanding those fraudulent claims like explainability, but also how do I go about raising uh, uh, these with my uh, fraudulent systems. In terms of technology, so uh, obviously with a move to digital, uh, we expect real time. So real time is a big thing, is a main focus right now for all insurers. So. When you go on a price comparison website and you ask for a quote, you expect that to happen instantaneously. But the same process happens with claim scoring, so claims decisioning. So we see a lot of insurers trying to move that process into a real-time system to be able to service their customers faster. Open source is prevalent everywhere right now. There's an increasing number of organizations moving to open source technologies. SaaS is embracing open source. And we are trying to help organizations operationalize open source models, which we see that can be a challenge sometimes. A solution and providers, uh, a lot of insurers are trying to reduce the, the footprint or a state of different solutions and consolidate them into a smaller chunk. Uh, but last and not least, innovation. So a lot of customers I've been talking to are trying to find new and innovative ways to uh, detect insurance fraud. Uh, and uh, as you guys mentioned, make data science available across the, the new business, uh, across the business. Uh, and it's not all about ripping and replacing the ways that you're used to working. It's a way to extend current capability. So the work that Covea is doing right now is a testament of this. The, 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 the models and projects you've created in products are a, a great intelligence support system for your investigators. And we see a lot of innovation uh, happening right now and uh, not only in traditional analytics, but image and speech is a, it's, a, it's, it's a focus right now and things like pattern matching. So uh, it's an exciting space to be in and uh, certainly that uh, data science analytics space is gonna grow even more in the, in the coming years. Thank you, Georgios. That was a really interesting insight. So, Finally, what's next for us then? So as a data science team, we are at just the beginning of our journey. Uh, we are going to continue to grow. We are going to continue to innovate in more areas, particularly around explainability. Um, and some of the talks that we're going to do in the future will really get into the depth of the sort of things that we are doing. Um, so thank you all for listening and apologies for some of the technical issues that we had today. Please do follow Kaveya Digital on LinkedIn and Twitter. We do post on there on some of the things that we are doing. Likewise, follow SAS. They've got an awful of interesting content. In fact, we feature in a little bit of it here, here and there. 
Um, if you do have any questions, please do put them into the YouTube live stream um, or failing that into Teams and we will do our best to answer. Uh, this will, of course, be recorded. So for those who had to join halfway through or after our little technical hiccup, you can see everything that we've been saying. We're all on LinkedIn as well. So if you want to give us any questions personally, feel free. Thank you very much. Just checking the questions at the moment on YouTube. I don't think there's any there at the moment, but um, I'm just having a look in the team. There seems to be a few bits that have been mentioned there recently. Okay. So I got a question from Tim. So he said, are you able to try to teach the model based on third party data source on a trial basis to see if it's worth pulling the data in permanently? Yes, uh, we certainly can. So we work with lots of suppliers, um, particularly in relation to how can we augment our data sets. We typically started off uh, mostly on our internal data. But there are, there are two types, you know, you can you can invest in in essentially variables for your models. So there are lots of companies that will specialize in trying to help you build variables that will understand certain demographics, for example. But also there's web scraping and general data sets. So what's the advantages, for example, of ingesting Met Office weather data? Um, so we, we do regularly try lots of very different methods, both internal and external, to try and boost the accuracy. But sometimes they don't. Uh, sometimes they can lead to overfitting, which obviously isn't, isn't ideal. Thanks, Tom. I think um, Tim's still typing at the moment, so. Sure thing. In a second, if that's a follow-up question, or if he's, yeah, still on his keyboard. <laughs> So follow-up question from Tim is, for the purpose of this question, I'm not interested in the data science and he's apologized, that's absolutely fine. Uh, but he's asked, what is the cloud infrastructure needed in terms of GPUs, CPUs, bandwidth, data lakes, et cetera? Uh, I'll, I'll make a stab at that, but feel free to dive in, um, either of you two. So it, it, in all honesty, it really depends. So for example, with SaaS, we do have a significant amount of cloud compute power behind, behind us to do that. You know, we can, we can host several terabytes of data in memory, for example, to process that. Um, GPU compute loads are particularly required, especially if you're doing more image-based processing, and we are trialing ideas uh, around that. I think for us, the, the uh, we're looking at how we can scale our compute needs, so we're not always throttling as much um, cloud compute resources possibly is expensive. So we sort of we try and be cognizant of when we have a large training job to do. Uh, I'm just referring back to your question. So, you know, we, we try and very much democratize GPU and CPU. So for example, in SAS and in many other open source platforms, we don't really need to necessarily be aware of what the resource being used is underneath. For the data scientists, we try and abstract that away as much as possible. So all they need to do is know, as long as they have an awareness, that if you're gonna try and train on 10 terabytes worth of high resolution satellite imagery, that's gonna cost quite a lot in terms of compute power, but they wouldn't have to be to concern with the actual low level allocation. Yeah, you're actually right, Tom. It, it really depends on the data sizes. Uh, it's good to have a system that kind of scale based on what compute you, you, you need, right? So if you have a small data set, you can pretty much run it off your laptop. But if you're dealing with loads and loads of data like you did uh, with your projects, you obviously need a, a, a highly scalable system behind the scenes. Thank you both. Um, um, again, there's another question in the chat there saying, have you experienced a throttling when you're doing a job? I seem to have gone green. <laughs> we can still hear you though, it's okay. Okay, so long as you can still hear me. Go on, you, one of you to answer that. Um, 
I can have a stab at this. So I think, yeah, in terms of experience of throttling when doing a job, I don't think we've had um, any particular issues. So um, as I mentioned in the section I was talking about earlier, um, we've got scheduled SAS code that runs every 24 hours. Um, and that usually takes, I think, about maybe 20 to 25 minutes usually on a typical day. And that will serve both models because both Tom and I are, are like after the same data from sort of the claims and fraud area to feed both our models. It's only just at the end where we split it out for, for the certain filters. So for me, it will be um, claims which have liability already predetermined by the claims teams. And Tom's obviously interested in the injury claim as well. And from there, that's where um, the data set splits and that feeds into the report that's hosted in via, which we showed the screenshots of earlier. Um, but yeah, I don't think we've experienced any particular issues in terms of the processing because we spent quite a lot of time making sure that it was a robust process and it could be done quite quickly and effectively as well without any issues. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question there, Tim. Um, I don't see any other questions on Teams or YouTube at the moment. Um, so unless anyone else has got any other questions, um, shall we end it there? I think so. So just uh, finally, thank you, Georgios, for taking the time. I know you. you've, helped, you've helped us a lot in our journey uh, in where we are today. So we're really grateful for your continued help and uh, what you've been, what you've uh, persevered with us today. So thank you. Uh, thanks to Liam in the background, who I know has been trying to grapple with the technology yeah. to make all this happen. So and thank you, Ashley, too. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank Enjoy the rest you of your thank evening. You. And uh, we'll see you at the next one. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice one. Bye bye.